Lieutenant Hector Ilario is living proof that Starfleet Academy produces the finest fighter pilots in the galaxy. Miles and Julian are very serious about their leisure activities, and forensic psychology wasn't exactly Esri's favorite subject at the Academy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk. Today, we're doing a review of Deep Space Nine Season 7, Episode 13, Field of Fire, directed by Tony Dow, written by Mr. Robert Hewitt Wolf. And what do you know, very special guest today, very, very special guest, Mr. Robert Hewitt Wolf has returned to the seventh rule. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, trying to stay cool in Los <laughs> Angeles. Um, <laughs> otherwise, good. Everybody at home, we are recording from a very hot day in LA. Uh, this episode yeah. came out in February 10th, 1999 where were you everybody srock you said it uh you said you love this episode huh yeah i <laughs> i was watching this episode uh just really intensely i thought it was excellent um so yeah uh robert this is your comeback after you had left the show right <laughs> yes my, my special it's like my special guest appearance more than my comeback <laughs> yeah well, i guess uh, you're right it's like a um and just the return the return of your style and your just great storytelling i love that i loved it yeah yeah can we talk For about sure. that because uh sure. you left after five seasons you were uh yeah. iris steven bear's writing partner or so it seems because every episode yeah. written by you was with him and with him is with you uh but then you left for uh greener pastures or just because you had five years and you wanted to try something new or what was the deal there mostly the the, the latter I, I you know five years i was uh we did 26 a year uh and you know because i was working with ira you know um we were just doing a lot of writing you know nonstop, and i was tired man i was just kind of burned out um and so and i'd also sold a pilot and a feature uh and so i wanted to work on those and yeah it was just that it was really just like i was kind of i was kind of done uh, <laughs> at the time and uh you know like you know they dragged me off as a wounded officer for a reason um <laughs> that's right you know it was it was it was all very amicable you know in fact the truth is i had a contract for the sixth season and I asked Ira to let me out of it. And he just, you know, as long as he said, as long as you don't go turn around and work on a different show, that's fine. <laughs> so, yeah, I was working on, I was working on this TV movie pilot and then the, the, the feature film. Um, and I had a couple other projects over the course of the, the two years between when I left and when I came back to do this. Um, did yeah, you have an author? Did you have the idea that you would probably be coming back to kind of do something like this? Or no, they asked me. They were just, "Hey, you want to do really? one?" Yeah, yeah. They asked me if I wanted to do <laughs> one. Pretty sure they had at least the bones or most of the story done, and they just like, "Hey, we we need someone to write this one. Would you do it as a freelancer?" And I I, I had a break in you know what I was the other stuff I was working on. Um, and, you know, it doesn't take too long to write one of these. It's like, you know, three, four week commitment. Um, so I is said, that yeah, like, sure. Is, is that like the band coming back together? Is that the yeah. feel of it when you come back? A little bit. I mean, yeah, it was fun. I, I, it was very fun to do. I mean, you know, obviously uh, uh, Brad and David were there, um, which was great. I love those guys. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was really nice to see everybody and hang out and work with them again. Um, and and you know the part of the attraction for me too was also uh i'd never written esri you know right. um so i had yeah. it was a new character to write which was fun you know um and that that to me was also like part of the attraction of doing it to be honest they asked me to write one in the big final arc and i i turned to, i said i could i shouldn't do it um because in those 10 episode, you know, that giant 10 episode arc, I just felt like there was no way I was going to, uh, to be able to do it justice, you know? So that one I passed on, but this one, this one seemed good. It was a standalone, which is easier to freelance. 
And it was about Esri, like I said, who I'd never really written. And so, yeah, it was, it was fun. It was really fun to do. So before, before Ira called you and said, we need you, Wolfie, before he did that, did you have any thoughts in those 18 months that you might come back or you would come back? Or did it feel very out of the blue? It felt a little out of the blue, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, obviously, I left on good terms with everybody. I love all those guys. Yeah. And I love the show. Um, but I figured, you know, once I had parachuted out of there, they, you know, <laughs> that was probably going to be it. Um, and I was okay with that. Like that was the deal, right? I was leaving to go do other things. Um, and there were, you know, there was other things too, which is like, this is going to get really deep in the weed on how a TV writing staff works, but you know, there's ranks, you rise up the ranks in the TV writing staff, just like in the military. And I, and I, season five, I was producer you know which is like you know sort of in the middle somewhere it's, you know as i would tell my dad it's sort of like a major <laughs> you know maybe lieutenant colonel um but there was no one below me every time i got promoted i was still the <laughs> lowest right. ranking guy in the staff you know? <laughs> um so i wasn't and that it wasn't really an ego thing but i wasn't really learning to sort of work with other writers below that reported to me yeah man you know i still always was on that show gonna report to everybody um and so i wasn't except when i worked with freelancers i wasn't really learning those skills and you know there was a it was a great place to learn how to be a writer uh star trek but if you were a writer it wasn't a great place to learn how to be a executive producer showrunner because um Rick kind of was very protective right. over post and the set and stuff like that. And, and, you know, on some shows, that's a very big part of the head writer's responsibility. Um, but I wasn't really getting any chance to really work with editors or, or, or directors that closely or with the cast, you know, like we're talking about Rick Berman, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Rick, um, which, you know, that it's just the way the show worked that, and it worked great. Right. Um, right. So that was another reason I left. I wanted to try mm-hmm. to like, learn how to sort of be my own boss a little bit more you know uh and to and hopefully to supervise other people which i eventually got to do but i didn't get to do it until after these and i was off the air <laughs> so <laughs> oops oh well um i have a question about how you approach this character because i feel like um the dax symbian character never really had this level of in-depth um kind of analysis about the conjuring up of past lives and how they can interact with them. I think that was really one of the things I took away from this as well. It was fun. I mean, I, I honestly, guys, I cannot remember the, the, the details of how everything there was come up with, but I remember that it was only 25 idea. years ago, man. What's the yeah, yeah. <laughs> 25 years. February uh, 15th, you know? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I don't really remember a lot of the detail and, and probably I wrote the script uh two months before that right so i was probably writing that script either like before or right after christmas break or whatever um but yeah i mean uh, that was one again one of the appeals of this was to really dig into esri dax and how she was dealing with this stuff we'd sort of established some of the the trill stuff Mm -hmm. in the previous seasons as far as like duran yeah 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 duran was an established thing and the idea that she could kind of like talk to her other selves or whatever was somewhat established. We didn't really make a lot out of it, but this was just a chance to really, really dig into it and do that ritual and all that other kind of stuff, which was fun. It was a little silence of the lambs, right? You know, except the serial killer was in her belly. (laughs) Right. It was part of her. Um, I did. Yeah. I did get the silence of the lambs vibe to it. But mm-hmm. with a very interesting twist that I thought made it unique in its own special way, particularly the the schizophrenic part of it. I, at some point, I was thinking maybe she's the kill, maybe she's Me killing too. people. When I first saw it, I was it, wondering right? if she was like the Tyler Durden or whatever. You know, what I mean? like yeah, yeah, yeah that would have been there. That would have been really fun. But then it's uh, like, how do you come back the, from like, that like, afterwards? Uh, yeah, right. Then she's criminal. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
But I was I tempted to go there in my mind. I was thinking, is she actually doing this in her sleep or, or is this, you know, other symbiont, this other host um, taking over her body and like, you know, conducting this without her consciously knowing about it? That was something yeah, that crossed my mind. I mean, the fun thing about Esri was, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I remember, <laughs> she, she wasn't really supposed to be the host, right? right? So this isn't really how she saw herself or her life unfolding. And so she's kind of saddled with this guy in a way that beyond how even Jadzia would have had to deal with him. Like Jadzia kind of like, you know, bought this house, you know? And but she was prepared. Every she had way inherited it. And so the problems inside of it, Jadzia was a little more like cool with because like she'd made that decision. Whereas Esri was more just like, this is some, there's some messed up stuff going on inside of me sometimes. So it was fun to do that way. Yeah. Uh, Esri was, yeah. as far as we know, the only uh, trill that's ever had a symbiont added to her without any preparation or training or, mm -hmm. You know, was it even her decision? I think, you know, I, I mean, it must have been. I mean, you, you probably was signed no that donor card when you're in yeah. high school. On <laughs> trail, receiver right? card, you know? right? Yeah, yeah, in case of emergency, I am willing to be a host. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> sure. Hmm. Um, but you never think it's going to happen, I would assume. There were a lot of elements that I thought that somebody who had to be versed about certain things would would have to know about. One of them was specifically the rifle and you know the use of this uh the rifle and the projectile kind of the methodology which you kind of assigned to it i felt was that, that your that, military dad yeah is that your, probably your yeah i don't guns? even know <laughs> right. yeah it's probably yeah. my military dad and, and all yeah. that kind of stuff the idea of like thinking about like how would a sniper work in star trek you know mm -hmm. Like, how would that work? And the idea of like a transporter and x ray goggles, you know, and a regular old bullet. That was fun. That, that was fun, yeah. you know. And I just thought that that was a really cool way to have a serial killer that was, you know, really hard to find using a really smart piece of technology. Um, but it also said something about the killer, which I kind of liked too. This idea that he doesn't get a thrill out of this you know he's a vulcan he's not capable of or he's trained in such a way to, to control those emotions so he doesn't enjoy the experience the way Duran did i think Duran was like an up close and personal kind of dude with a knife you know and that's not who this guy is this guy is kind of like he's deeply deeply screwed up yeah but he's still a vulcan you know, and he'd still rather kill you from a thousand feet away than see your, see your, you know, than, than be in your face when it happens. Because logic demands it, he said. Uh, <laughs> and I believe he had the trauma of being one of six survivors out of 1,250 on a ship. I didn't yeah. write the, the, which ship down, I don't think. But I mean, that's, you know, a human would be riddled with guilt and would have survivors guilt and, and all these kind of things. And a, and a Vulcan, I guess, you know, handles those emotions differently or suppress those emotions differently yeah i mean i think that that's what he's in a weird way like logic demands it well i do like that line i can't remember whether <laughs> that was mine or not to be honest <laughs> but but like he is in emotional turmoil he is really really yeah. suffering this guy and you know vulcan training and the, the sort of philosophy dictates that i mean vulcans do feel they just don't express their feelings right and they and they cling to this cold logic and that just was all completely failing him i think is really what we were trying to say and that in war even vulcan you know this war is so bad that even a vulcan can get this bad you yeah. know that was kind of also what we were trying to say like you know it was part of the showing the damage that the, that the that the war was doing to just everyday you know rank and file star fleet regular people you know that kind of even thing. the toughest yeah, even the yeah, uh, you know I, I'm a big fan of uh, Peter Falk and Columbo. I've talked about yeah, it on this are. podcast before. Every episode, <laughs> <laughs> well, I just I just love the way those uh, episodes unfold, and particularly Peter Falk's way of kind of deducing what happens. But that's one of the things that I I had the element of while watching this as well is 
this clever way of of constructing a killing so that it wasn't just boring to watch you know some guy just shoot somebody and it's just you know it's not that much of a mystery behind it there's it's the complexity so when you are constructing that um you know at what point did you say oh my god this is brilliant beam the bullet because i was thinking a plus a plus wow this guy yeah. said beam the bullet that was like amazing how you know how do you construct it in a way where you you have to make something so difficult that it's not easy for the the viewer to kind of solve mm-hmm. i mean uh, you, you again you just have to kind of figure out that puzzle box right this is essentially a locked what they call a locked room mystery right Guy was alone in his quarters, doors were shut, no one walked in, someone shot him. Now, in a Star Trek universe, obviously, there's a lot of ways to do that, and and that's what I was really trying to come up with, was like a cool way to do a locked room mystery in this universe, but but still have it be investigatable, right? I still wanted it to have enough logical kind of consistency and like to be, so it is a physical weapon. I wanted it to not be like magic. You know, it's just a super cool weapon that he's using, right? right. Um and and that so that's that's how I constructed that. It's really interesting though because of course, you know, subsequently I've done. I was five years on elementary writing murder mysteries all the time. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm watching this one going like, mm, I could do better. You know, the mystery. <laughs> the mystery's okay. It's fine. You're like I've been. I've gotten better since then. <laughs> I've definitely gotten better. Like the, the, the problem for me with this mystery. Uh. And look, it's a fun episode. Like, I, and I'm 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 happy with the way it turned out. And again, I can't remember for the life of me what's mine and what's anybody else's. So mm-hmm. I'll take credit <laughs> for anything or or give credit to everybody else for everything. I think the gun was me. I I don't remember. I really don't. But but like now now as a as like a guy who's written like you know five years on a on a on a really really carefully constructed you know murder mystery show. Um, the biggest problem for me is there's no play along, what we call play along. In other words, at no point do you meet the killer until you meet the killer and you know he's and in that moment she knows she knows he's a Vulcan. She's starting to look at Vulcan. She has a meeting with this guy in the turbo lift, and she realizes, oh my god, this is the killer, which is a great thriller moment. It's like, mm-hmm. oh fuck, I'm you know, oh That's okay. I'm in the elevator with a killer, you <laughs> right. know. Um, but it does it, as a mystery. It it's a little it's a little sketchy to be honest. <laughs> mm. In this sort of like how we would have done it on you know elementary or or how I would do it if I were going to do it today. Um, well, how would you do it if you did it today? Well, I probably would have structured it a little more rigorously, you know. Um, and that like I love all the character beats and stuff, but like. I probably would have wanted the her to get into the mystery quicker and her to do more, maybe with the help of Odo, to do more hmm. of the sort of like we never get to see her talk to any suspects, right? I mean, we just see that one guy who's a weapons collector, <laughs> you know, yeah. he's a gun nut. He's a Starfleet gun nut. But <laughs> like even he is not like we think we don't know why Odo thinks it's you know what I mean? It's like it's like the, the scenes don't hit each other like little dominoes like they're supposed to in a murder mystery in a really really carefully crafted one um but whatever i mean <laughs> so so you you would you would have introduced the killer earlier and kind of had her following him or maybe he's part of the investigation I, to some degree yeah i would have at least like shark finned him at some point and it would have been nice to have met a couple other legitimate suspects like for her to identify that guy not odo not for it to happen randomly to her but for her to identify him and then for the fact that they identified him to help us understand why it isn't him i mean odo both like arrest finds him arrests him and alibis him all off screen you know yeah and look again like the truth is the real fun of the episode is Esri and Duran, right? Right. And so, like, I'm sure, Sirach, you're, like, watching it not caring about any of that, right? And No. I, that's I, fine. That's, that's a, yeah. good. Like, yeah. you shouldn't have to care about that stuff. It's just me watching it after being on a Sherlock Holmes show for all those years going, like, you know. Yeah. Give me mm-hmm. better. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> that's I, interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, speaking of the Duran, I thought he did a, a fantastic job at his performance in this yeah, episode. Yeah, so, yeah mm-hmm. the actor who played him was awesome and very good at kind of goading her and just you mm-hmm. know trying to get that out of her. I yeah, thought he, he never went over the top. Step. Like he never never felt like a full on monster, which I think really kind of helped in a way. Yeah. You know, he just like the gun's not loaded. You know, that whole that was a really fun moment. You know that he was trying to go to deploy the trigger, and then he says the gun's not loaded. But you know, is it? <laughs> yeah. Well, also like, but just getting her to pull the trigger would be such a huge victory for yeah. him. You know yeah. what I mean? That's why he didn't tell her until after she put the gun down. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, I thought I, I don't remember if it's this. We saw Duran before, right? I can't remember. <clears throat> yeah, I was trying to guy, think that as well. I'll, I'll look it I up. I can't remember. I can't yeah, but he, de- he definitely didn't stand out like to the degree that he did in this episode. If he if we did see him at all, well, I know he he was in the episode where everybody was possessed by an aspect of Dax, right? But that means yes. he was played by somebody else, and I can't remember right. who. Like it might have been Odo, uh, who played Duran. I I should have. Uh, uh, Odo had the frizzy hair. He played uh, Kazan, I think, with the frizzy yeah. hair. Uh, oh, Curzon. you're right. You're right. Yeah. Curzon, yeah. Curzon. He played Curzon. You're right. So I can't yeah. remember. Was it, was it Cisco? I can't remember who got Duran. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a question, uh, though. So Duran, okay. real quick. Uh, yeah. This was his only, this was this actor's only portrayal of Duran. So I guess it was somebody right. else playing him. Like or or the, the it leads. was just, we never really saw him. Or yeah, was an extra saw. or something like that. Yeah. The good thing and, it, it was season one, right? Facets? Was it Facets? I think so. Yeah. I think that was season one. It's either season one or season two. And so no one's going to remember anymore. Even and the well, you address the guy's face. Lee episode. McCloskey. Yeah. Lee McCloskey. I thought yeah, you addressed I, it in this episode when you said that uh, Jadzia had repressed his memories. <laughs> so you kind of addressed the fact that he wasn't brought to the forefront of the dex yeah mine yeah i mean i've always but i did always think that that was an interesting part of dax you know and we spent so much time on curzon you know right and and so little time on any of her other previous lives and this was always the one that i thought was like this guy's you know interesting and also he does bring a tool set you know he does bring a certain set of skills (laughs) He does. But I mean, he had the knowledge. It was that, like you said, they, uh, you know, the silence of the lambs. But I do yeah. remember that we did deal with Dax in a different way. And that was in the episode where I think she was being tried for past murders. Yes. And they were. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what I was that's thinking what, about. Yeah. That was what well, that's what I'm thinking about, too, is, as right. far <laughs> as the past host being a murderer and her being guilty or uh, for that. Right. Or, or you know, whether she was guilty or innocent. That was kind of the concept of that episode, which was really good as well. Yeah. Is that Dax? That was like a first season episode too, right? Mm-hmm. The episode was called I, Dax. I think so. I think it was like episode yeah. four or something like that. Yeah, it was way, a good one though. It was like, way. it was right before, it was like, I think they were shooting that as I came on or something like that. And I remember it being like, wow, okay, this is really good, you know? Um, and yeah, I, I, I sometimes like people kind of bag on the first season, but I do think that there's a, a number of really good episodes in the first mm-hmm. season. And I think Dax is one of them. I mean, it's not one that people think about when they think about the good episodes of the, you know, everyone's always talking about a duet, you know, duet. and yeah. Look, yeah. I mean, duet is spectacular, right? But there's also like other really solid episodes in there. And I think Dax is kind of one of them. And I guess this is kind of a sequel to it in a way. Okay. So uh, Dax was season one, episode seven. Right. Uh, I feel so stupid for having said four or five. Please forgive <laughs> me, everybody at home. They're yelling at their screens right now. Just blocking past prologue out of your mind is what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, so we're going to hit our break in just a second here. But, Robert, I want to, uh, on the other side, I want to ask you about Davy Crockett. Because somebody clearly has a lot of Davy Crockett knowledge when in, in the, on the writer's team or you. So I'm going to definitely want I'm, I'm gonna to know leave that. it as a cliffhanger, too. I, know. I can totally tell you <laughs> who it is. But <laughs> All right. So everybody uh, stick around. I mean, you're going to get all your Davy Crockett needs on the other side. So don't go <laughs> anywhere. This is the big time. Uh, stick around. We'll be right back on the seventh rule. Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule with Sirach Lofton and Mr. 
writer producer Robert Hewitt Wolf. Uh, very sure. quickly. Uh, oh, we are doing a review of Deep Space Nine, season seven, episode 13. We're at the midway point of the final season. Shed your tears now. The episode is called Field of Fire. Uh, okay, wipe up your tears. And here are the trivioids of the week that may or may not have made the cutting room floor. Lieutenant Hector Ilario is living proof that Starfleet Academy produces the finest fighter pilots in the galaxy. Miles and Julian are very serious about their leisure activities. Lieutenant Hector Ilario never had real sorry in Brandy before. Esri starts her day with Finalian T, hot. Uh, TR-116 rifle was a prototype that shot a chemically propelled tritanium bullet. That's nerdy talk if I ever heard it. Uh, <laughs> Star Trek fans love that stuff. Forensic psychology wasn't Esri's favorite subject at the Academy. And Worf is worried about Esri Dax. That was adorable. I am not was, worried. Yeah, was I, I would be worried about anybody on the ship. Or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I'll get not... all defensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, all I right. was like, uh, why is she walking around the ship when it's that empty and dark? You know? like, <laughs> <laughs> horror, <laughs> horror, creepy. His yeah, excuse creepy was pretty bad, movie. too. He's like... You shouldn't oh, yeah. be walking around I mean, all like in the yeah. shoebox shuttle. She's a she's an officer. He's, He's fine. Bro. Definitely got baggage. Uh, yeah, and you can't can you blame the poor guy. I you know. know. Well, uh, this is the first time actually. I think we saw him soften up around her because he's been avoiding her this whole season. Mm -hmm. um, this was the first time they actually had this connection. Yeah. Again, like being a freelancer, you know, I I, I was kind of dropped in the middle, um, so I didn't really know fully how the wharf esri stuff was playing out um mm -hmm. so i just sort of did what they told me to do <laughs> Actually, um, real quick does that mean that they had to bring you up to speed or did they say yeah. you know basically nothing's changed or had you been no. watching the episodes on your own well, I, you I, yeah but obviously when you're writing you're 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 months ahead of of, right. of where the the show is so um it was more like i think they gave me a bunch of scripts to read i think i read all the scripts that up until this is 13 wow. so i probably read or i read like key scripts up until then um and story documents and stuff like that because there weren't scripts even for some of the stuff they were being written you know like i i'm sure like 11 and 12 were being written while yep. i was breaking 13 and writing the story and the outline and stuff like that so yeah it was like you know, it was kind of, it was kind of uh, not make it up as I go along, but I just had to kind of trust the guys to, to tell me what to do. And the truth is like this, this one is more heavily rewritten than when I would have been on staff just because they had to make it fit. And so there's probably, you know, less of my words in this than anything else I wrote for Deep Space Nine, but like more than what I wrote for Visful Data, you know? Because at least I was the guy who knew the show and all that stuff. So, um, so there's definitely stuff in there that, like I said, I can't remember who did what anymore. But there's definitely stuff in there that was like that. You know, real quick, Sorok and I are always talking about, and you mentioned them at the top of this uh, first segment, and now again here, kind of hinted at it. David Weddle and Bradley, Bradley Thompson. Thompson, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we saw their names a ton in the first five seasons, and then they became, I think, executive story editor. And we've mm -hmm. never met them or spoken with them. They're like this all-knowing, all-present yeah. Yeah, duo. Can you tell us exactly what their presence was and you know how they influenced? I mean, clearly they were involved in some way in every oh, single yeah. episode for the last two seasons. Yeah. So they, they were freelancers originally. You know, and um, so they came in. They pitched us some stories. They sold us some stories. And, and they, they always turned in good drafts. And so when, when it was time for me to go, I think that that's, I was just like, well, who, who are our most reliable freelancers, you know, mm. who should we look at? And I think Weddle and Thompson were the guys that he, he thought about because, you know, they were, they were delivering when they were free, freelancers. So they came in at story editor, executive story editor, whatever that is. Again, this is all just ranks. Right. Um, and yeah, like they're really good writers and they're really good guys. And, um, you know, they, they, they're a really good team in that, like, you know, D David's a little more of the sort of like, you know, bigger, not bigger personality, but just sort of like he's the extrovert <laughs> and Brad is a little more Zen. 
Um, but like they're just they do terrific work. I think that what are they on now? I think they're on for all mankind now. Yeah, they, they, or they were. Right. I don't know what they're doing right now. And Strzok um, and I were also wondering if one is like the dialogue guy and one is the structure guy, or how they're. You never know how work. a team works yeah. when you're not in the team. You know, I mean, like Ira and I sat in front, you know, sat in front of the same, sat in front of the computer and I typed and he, you know, we riffed on things. And so we wrote every scene together. So everything is both of us, right? Yep. There's no like that division of labor, but there are guys who divvy things up into drafts, you know, into acts, you know, and they just pass drafts back and forth to each other. And so maybe one of them gets his final say on dialogue or, or whatever, but it's usually just a, 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 like a ping pong game. Like here's a draft. Okay. Here's my version of the draft. Okay. Splitting, here's my version of the draft. Splitting acts sounds dangerous though. Like feels like there might be a, a, a different be, voice, like, you know, going through. I mean, you know, if you're a team, eventually that all gets smoothed out in the process anyway. And if you've been writing together for a long time, you sort of know each other's voices and it's mm-hmm. sort of, it's a little less, but like a lot of times, like I know a team that uh, one of them would do the beginning and the end and the other would do the middle. <laughs> and it was kind of <laughs> like, okay, you know, that's, that's a way to go. Uh, I worked, I, I, re, I co-wrote some things on the show that I just uh, finished for Netflix that unfortunately will probably never see the light of day. Uh. Um, and we would split them down the middle, but these were half hours. So, so I would write the first or 15 pages and you write the second 15 or vice versa. Um, and you know, like I said, it's just a, it's a thing, but wait, we, we owe, but we owe the audience. We we left on a cliffhanger and I feel like we, we we're not. Uh, yeah. We got to dig up. What's up with threat. David Crockett. It's on my question list too, man. I want Ira. Know it's all Ira, man. He's obsessed with the Alamo. He knows all about all those guys. Um, and yeah, he just is totally into the Alamo. Um, he's, he and his buddies, I don't know if they still do this, but once every year or two, he and his buddies would go to San Antonio for like a, you know, dude's weekend and hang out at both the real, real Alamo and the faux Alamo, which I don't know whether you guys know that this exists, but there's a, there's a Alamo. So the real Alamo is like in downtown San, San Antonio, like it's what, it's just right there in the town, right? So there's nothing like around it. You're not in the old west. But yeah. I think for the movie The Alamo, they built a you know, a full Alamo out in the you know, out in the boonies somewhere near San Antonio. Yes. And so they would go visit that too and hang out, and, you know. That's that's apparently pretty cool to see too. So he yeah, that's all him. He's just totally into it. Although I had a uh distant relative who was there wow really? Uh, yeah yeah um and i cannot remember his first name anymore but uh but well, there was a wolf there <laughs> my family's <laughs> been like dying for this country for a long time um so wow. so yeah there was a there was some uncle something or other that was there i cannot remember his first name anymore um so so the other question i had which was kind of piggyback off the davy crockett alamo uh question was the 20th century crime novel um authors or writers that you can the stories that you mentioned with odo's character i think you yeah. mentioned raymond raymond chandler and mike hammer are those yeah is that is that an ira insert as well no i think that, that i think that was me <laughs> okay all right i well, think tell, that was tell me, me. About, tell me about their influence well, I just, I mean, I've, I've always enjoyed detective novels and, and, um, and mysteries. Um, and like Chandler's really, really good. You know, M- Mickey Spillane's My Camera stuff is kind of Mickey trashy, Spillane. you right. know, but I just thought that it was, it would be funny if Odo liked the really trashy ones. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like the really just, he like, would you know, too. <laughs> that was did, you know, <laughs> yeah. Those kind of things, like the Chandler guy, you know, Chandler, like Marlowe is a little less is definitely, you know, he gets beat up more than he beats people up, you know, um, and I can see that guy appealing to Odo, too. But like just as like escapist fantasy, because he is a cop like and he's reading these detective novels and he clearly doesn't like see them as like reading about work. You know what I mean? They're just they're right. escapist fantasy for him and he just enjoys them for what they I- are, which is like old trash. <laughs> I can totally see Odo doing that. Like he's serious, 
25 hours a day, but then on that 26th yeah. hour, he closes the blinds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shuts yeah. all the <laughs> doors. He's like, all right, well, time to read Reads some like, trashy novel. <laughs> yeah, I read some trashy novel for like a half an hour. Um, get the bad guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, Odo is a little bit of a fascist deep at heart. Like, he, you know, he definitely is like. <laughs> with or without you know. the belt. Yeah. With his yeah. with his Dick Tracy, uh, you know, that was a close one. <laughs> <laughs> and no, not that. Uh, but uh, I had another uh, um, question for you too. There were a couple of digs that you took um, using Duran's character, which I thought was hilarious, and I love the lines. One of them was when you kind of, you know, when they were going through the woman that died at, towards the end, the Greta character. And you said, oh, wow, uh, use Duran to say that, you know, she was a rat pat, you know, a pat rack. And uh, you said a, a, a monument to bad taste, you know, kind of going through her apartment. Yeah. But then you then you use the same you use Duran's voice to also kind of dig at Cisco, which I thought was hilarious. Um, what does he say about Cisco? He says. Uh, man, I forgot. Uh, He's, he, he comes in, he says, gosh, what's what, basically, you know, what's wrong with that guy? Uh, <coughs> uh, but there was, oh, he goes on a, a quirk as well. And he says, I'd like to slip a knife in his ribs talking about. Yeah, quirk. between his ribs. I wrote that line down. That was a that was a sharp, no pun intended. That was a sharp line yeah. right there. I liked it. Yeah. 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 Like, I, I just I, I just think, you know, look, <laughs> Duran doesn't get out much. But he still <laughs> like experiences everybody. You know what I mean? And yeah. and so he would definitely have a different attitude on everybody than and I think like you know, I think he is uh whatever. I don't know what the technical term is. I don't want to screw it up and get my psychotherapist wife mad at me. <laughs> but but um he's a sociopath, right? I mean, Duran is Duran is a, a narcissist and a sociopath and so he he he's looks down at everybody around him, doesn't really see them as you know, have any merit of being alive really you know and i was the, the vanderway thing was it was supposed to be vanderway but they pronounced it vanderweg but but the <laughs> the uh the thing about her was again like it was just an opportunity to show like other people in starfleet you know and and like there's a bunch of starfleet officers on here and we don't really get to see them but in their own stories they're the heroes you know yes elario is basically like a season one deep space nine character just newly arrived. He is here. Yeah. Like he's been there for 10 days and he has the same like wide eyed, excited thing. And he's like, I'm 22 years old. Like, you know, and Bashir was like, whatever, 28 when he showed up, you know, 27 or whatever he was. And now Bashir is 34 and he's looking at this kid just like, you know, he's just a giant puppy dog, but that's where our characters were. That, the intention was to sort of show with Ilario is like this is where our characters were seven years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the he, they are not only the heroes of our story now, but they are perceived as the heroes by the people around them. Mm -hmm. You know, the new guys. Um, but also like with Vanderway being a pack rat, you know, and with the Bolian, you know, having you know it, the Bolian, you know, there's a, it's a it was a non, it was a, a poly, it was a poly, the guy was in a poly marriage, by the way. Yeah, I, that was, I yeah, forgot I'll, all about co-father co or something that. like that. Co-husband. Right? Co-husband. Co Co-husband. Co yeah. I don't know how bowling and marriages work, but why should they work like ours? So that I just, yeah. or, or like our mainstream ones. So I just threw that in there. And yeah. Dorians um, and Denobulans have uh, different things like that as well. It was just, the idea was just to sort of show that these characters had a life. That these characters yeah. that are dying were people that mattered to somebody else, and that they were they sh they should have been they should have been characters in their own show, but mm -hmm. they weren't, you know. So they didn't really they didn't get the spotlight the way they should have, and then this guy killed them, and it just sucks. Including the Vulcan right? character. I mean, the yeah. Vulcan and character too. He yeah, he's he got a backstory. Of the, of he wasn't story. just yeah. some random killer. They you explained a reason for it, and I submit yeah. that. The what you would have added, you know, 15, 20 years later, as far as the things you mentioned in the first segment, we probably would have lost these things, the backstory of Ilario, you know, and, yeah. you know, I'm not That's saying one way or the other is better. I'm just saying, like, sure. we did get to find out not just who he was and what he did, but his struggles. He wanted to befriend Julian and O'Brien. They said no. He liked uh, Ezra. Like, 
we got we got an entire story. We know everything about yeah. him. And you did that for us to feel the death much more. Uh, so it's just kind of a different idea. way of storytelling. I, I think I would have, I, I, I'm, yeah, you know, the truth is, I don't know that there was room. I, if I had, and I've had to choose between those two things, I'm sure I would have chosen the character stuff, right? Mm. You know, because at the end of the day, the mechanics aren't, like I said, what anyone's going to remember about these episodes. We only have it's just three minutes. <laughs> yeah. But, but I still, I, somewhere deep in my soul, I believe that if I could take a pass at that script right now, I could have kept all that stuff <laughs> and still put in like two better mystery beats. Yeah, but maybe not. Who knows? Probably. Uh, but how strange is it though that because now you're coming back, and I don't. There wasn't really that many main characters in this episode. That the, the pretty much the bulk of yeah. this episode is people that you were you didn't work with when you were had just last left. I mean, the majority you have Durans, Dur- all the victims are new. Uh, yeah, Nicole, it's a, it's really yeah. a two hander, right, between the two of them. Yeah. And then obviously Odo and O'Brien have some prominence as well. Right. Um, but uh yeah, it's not really Cisco's barely in it, Kira's barely barely barely. In it. Right. Work is barely in it. Um yeah, is, it's just is that that's not a big challenge when you have just basically all new storylines to just to kind of build up on or is that I think it was part of the fun for me, to be honest. Okay. Again, like you know, I'd done five years of writing all those characters i love them right um but it was fun to me it's i i you know for me it's writing characters writing character you just hope the actor is going to bring it you know and i thought nicole did a by the way did a terrific job in this episode she's really good mm-hmm. um I, I really like her as an actress she was a great find you know um so that was cool i um, agree I thought she and I thought the kid who played Alario was really pretty good too. You know, he had the right combination of like wide eyed, you know, and played the drunkenness and like, yeah. oh, you know, just, sort of yeah, stumbly tried to flirt with with, with Ezra. Yeah. I thought he was yeah, tomorrow nice I'll be sober, but you'll still be beautiful. I was like, ooh, write that down. Yeah, <laughs> we, both, we we both wrote that. Actually, all three of us wrote it down. Yeah. We did it first, right? Yeah. Well, that's the Churchill line, but the opposite, right? The Churchill oh. line is uh, this woman coming up to him at something and saying he's uh, it's accredited to Churchill that he's drunk, you know, he's and he's like, I knew about a more ugly and in the morning I shall be sober, but you yeah. shall still be ugly. <laughs> okay. You know, so I just flipped it. <laughs> and, and, it yes, and it works It's a good well. line. It's a good line when you flip it like that. I actually mm-hmm. really love that. But talking um, about the uh, the just the the little side characters as well real quick i did want to point out that you know wharf had his only a little moment but it, it was great you know like it gave us a little bit of character development there like a little bit of a change odo had a little bit but especially and, and quark had a great one which opened up the great line about sliding a, a knife between his ribs which is very colorful but i thought yeah. cisco came in and put in his day of work very sure. well like i yeah. really liked because it felt like it when I saw that scene with him, it made me realize that we haven't seen much of him lately. It, it felt like we haven't seen very much Cisco lately, and I saw him just kind of commanding that scene and with his with his big old presence and being like super calm but still stern. I was like, "Ooh, I like me some Cisco." So yeah. even he had a yeah. really good moment there that I, I loved. And look again, like I can't, I don't know how much of that was me and how much it was like. Um, I think mm-hmm. probably Iron Hondry wrote this. I have no idea. Might have been somebody else. It might have been Renee. I don't know. I don't remember anymore. But, but obviously the staff did work on it. And how much of finding those moments for the regulars or or amplifying them or tweaking them was in the original outline. I wish I could find the document. Um, but it's you know it's. It's it's really I, I think again it's also the measure of a seven seven season show where you can have Cisco come in and it still feels like he's got a tremendous yeah. amount of presence even though he's barely in the episode you know um, and a credit to Avery as always like I always I, I always love to sing Avery's praises you heard it here first everybody Robert said he's going to look for the original document <laughs> <laughs> no the line that Duran gives to cisco is uh he says he's so insufferable that was exactly 
<laughs> he walks away saying that. I loved it. I loved it. I was like, wow, this guy, Duran, is no joke. He just comes at everybody. Well, um, I mean, he's, I mean, Duran is a garbage person. Let's be honest. Yeah, like, he's a yeah. horrible person. And so, you know, he would not like an authority figure like Cisco. He would, you know, right. he would see Quark as a potential victim that would be fun to kill. Like, he just has a, he just sees the whole world through that filter of like, you know, people are yeah. just things that he projects onto and does with what he wants, right? And if they're right. annoying, kill them. And if they're pompous, kill, you know, if they're an authority, then they then dismiss them. And if you can't do that, kill them. You know what I mean? He only right. killed three people, though. He wasn't that good a serial killer. He, he should, <laughs> yeah, he should but, be a little but, more humble. <laughs> but, but, but he does like to play kind of a judge and jury for people's character. And yeah. when he he likes to just put a sign or subscribe whatever he feels is their character and and kind of condemn them in that type of Correct. way. Correct. He creates want- he creates them in his own mind and then judges them in a weird right. way. Like he's not perceiving people, he's kind of imagining what he thinks prescribing. They are or projecting he's prescribing. Onto them. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which which gives him then the kind of validation for um doing whatever he does to them right Right. this is the the reasoning because they are obviously such and such or this and that so right um but i do want to say that there was a a moment there when they did introduce duran and he was playing that keyboard kind of uh you know the the, the fans of the opera bit yeah instrument Uh, too i was trying to figure out what yeah yeah the instrument itself was cool but also the music coming out of it was eerie and kind of mm-hmm. that, you know, uh, horror film kind of music. But you rarely hear the evil horror film music while somebody's playing it themselves. It's usually yeah. just in the background. Right. Uh, I, just, I just thought that was great that it's written into the scene uh, so that, you know, they had to build whatever this thing was. I mean, it is a dream sequence too, right? So you can get away with having it be a yeah. little bit over the top. Right. Because it's not real. Right. I mean, it's not like this is all in her mind. So so in her mind, yeah, Duran has a villain entrance, you know, yeah. like she's not just With his own theme him. music. <laughs> yes. Yeah. She's not just finding him like making his espresso or whatever. He's, he's like, you know, he's fucking he's playing the evil organ evilly, you know. <laughs> yeah. So so. Uh, it's really that's really about how Ezri perceives him, right? Um, okay. As like this kind of like overt villain, monster, phantom of the opera, the thing that you know hides in the basement and makes this awful music, you know, in in her mind. That's that's who he is to her, right? Right. Um, you know, I wouldn't funny. do that in real life. Like if it were real life, you know what I mean? Right. Like, I would never have done that. Yeah. Right. You know, because it's just it's very over anything. the top. You know what I mean? But in a I mean, you, sequence, you could, you could if you're writing Joker. You know, a, you know, Joker sure, would do that. Sure. Well, comic book movie, yes, you could do that in a comic book movie where you think, <laughs> okay, this character is like, you know, he he was waiting until I walked in the door to start playing the organ like that. You know, before <laughs> that, he was like watching Friends reruns on Netflix or whatever, and That's then, evil you enough. know, because he wants to make an impression. He's doing that, you know? <laughs> right? Doesn't well, spend I all did, free time. I did find myself organ, wondering right? when I saw that. I did actually wonder in my notes, like what it looks like on the script. You know, Duran plays evil organ <laughs> music or sinister, <laughs> like what the descriptors. Yeah, if were. only sure I knew no where that script was, yeah. then we might be able to answer all these questions. But yeah. I did not take the time to look for it. I, and I no did idea also, where by the way, the most iconic part of this episode for me is what i've got behind me which is that yellow you know visor screen thing yeah uh it's iconic it's interesting it hasn't been done before it's a little reminiscent of the gem hadar ships but yeah. then also the fact that what you're seeing when you're seeing through that eyepiece is all in yellow i don't know it, it was a very interesting and memorable take like for me having not seen this episode in in so long that's what I remembered. You know, that's the one where you go, oh, that's right. This is yeah, that one. And look, it's a great scene between the two of them when they're when she's wearing it, right? That's yes. the the fun of the sequence is that 
it is a really nice sequence of, you know, when they're when whenever she's got the rifle and she's with him, those are great scenes. And so the the prop is kind of iconic and it and it and it works really well. It doesn't, it's not like those awful ones in um was it called arms where they had the things on their shoulders that didn't yeah. that look that I was like, yeah. oh, I regret those. Oh, no, um, yeah. you know, this is much better as far as like what kind of a, an aiming eyepiece type thing. It's 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 it's, it's, it's a nice it's a nice design. I like the yellow. It's really poppy. I have no idea who's whose yeah. idea that was. Uh, yeah, I, I did like the scene because he kept he he was playing that devil on her shoulder, kind of just do it, do it. And he was even doing that in the moment where I almost was siding with him when <laughs> when the Starfleet officer was running and, you know, she trips him and kind of gets in that. I was, you know, he was kind of convincing me to say, yeah, yeah, there's no that problem easy. with this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, kill him. It's probably him. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably yeah. Why else is he? Why else is he running? Yeah, you know? well, yeah. It's a, that's like <laughs> LAPD one hundred and one, right? Yeah, All right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we, we, well, why was he running? Of course, we why shot was him. he running? If he wasn't guilty, he had yeah. to have uh, robbed the bank. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. No. Or maybe uh, terrified of police. And I, and I and I love that scene in there because it does explain that kind of a situation where police kind of just run into a, a conclusion based on circumstantial things that are floating around in their head, you know, based on their ideas of what they perceive to be the truth. Um, yeah. And I thought Cisco was a great voice in that moment where he's based, you know, he's explaining to Esri why he's not the guy that we're looking for and how, you know, and why that, she, yes. that yeah. having those assumptions of guilt, if you're right. in law enforcement is bad, right? Right. <laughs> and thank like, goodness she didn't go through with it. Right. Exactly. She was actually thinking, and then suddenly you've got a different character. Now Esri yeah. has excluded herself from the second half of the season, basically. Yeah. Well, like, blood on I her mean, hands, blood yeah. on her hands, like the dream. Yeah. I mean, I have mm -hmm. friends, uh, a very close friend who, who, you know, had a long career in the police um, and never used his gun. Uh, but just like the the awfulness of that moment, you know, of making those decisions, I you know, I can't imagine like like you want to come home to your wife and kids, you have a lot of, but you have these prejudices in your head, and you're you're jumping to these assumptions based on circumstantial evidence, and to make that decision. I mean, I don't envy anybody who has to deal with that. That's that's mm -hmm. rough, right? Um, right? But like you, you know, that we we need to be better than actually pulling that trigger or using the knife, right? So it was uh, a nice scene for that. The other thing I thought was interesting was that the mental health professional, who in this case is Esri, has a mental health issues herself. <laughs> yeah, and 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 then who does that person go to? And the other thing I thought was interesting is how she did what most people, I believe, do in those situations, which is not tell anybody. Right? Yeah. She said, I'm not going to tell Cisco. Right? And I think that too many people um, don't want to reach out for help and get a therapist or get some kind of uh, advice from externally. They try to deal with it on their own, yeah. which is something that you kind of you know, laid out pretty well in this episode. And I think like, uh, you know, I've always, I, it's something that my wife is a, was a therapist and I do believe that, you know, reaching out for help is important for people. And, um, you know, that's all, I mean, that was really what, you know, hard time, you know, that's what, that's what, um, O'Brien really needed to do more than anything was reach out for help. He didn't believe he was worthy of help, you know, or people were capable of helping him. And I think if anything, I, you know, that's one thing I do trying to show sometimes in my writing, which is that, you know, everyone's worthy of help and it's there if you look for it. And, you know, there are, there are situations where you're not going to get to where you need to be if you don't do that, you know? Yeah. Um, and that was a mistake by Esri, right? She yeah. very nearly came close to killing somebody because she wasn't really sharing the burden the way she should have been. Or, or help having anyone help her walk through this awful situation with, with Duran, you know? So everybody at home, if you find yourself with a strong addiction to, say, Star Trek, 
go seek help. <laughs> Cold tur- no, you watch as much Star Trek as you like. Uh, but we only have a, a minute left here. We're going to have to run in a second. So we want to give a very special thanks to a group of people, starting with Homer Frizzell in Walter Koenig's former apartment complex in New York. He's got a really long name. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom Carmen, a.k.a. Skillet, Tim Baum, a.k.a. Grandpa One, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin. Uh, Arukin. Titus Muller, Darlena Marie, John Mann, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Rex A. Wood, Anil O. Palat, Erica Strom, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Neil Akasaka, Justine Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Fultz, and of course, her buddy's favorite, Dr. Susan V. Gruner. Robert, this has been so cool. Feels like forever since we've seen you. We really appreciate you yeah, taking the time out of your busy day to do this for us. Uh, thank you so much for playing with us. Always fun, everybody. Live long and prosper. All that good stuff. And uh, have a great, have a great the rest of your day. Yeah. I'm going to awesome. hit leave. Here I go. Oh wait, no, not yet. <laughs> no, not everybody, yet. Okay. Everybody at home, stick around <laughs> for the free for all. A lot of those people we just mentioned will be there. And uh, go tweet Robert Hewitt Wolf and tell him how much you enjoyed seeing him and hearing his words. Uh, Writer Geek HW, something like that. Writer Geek RHW. Writer Geek yeah. RHW yeah. on Twitter. Yeah, I'm sorry I can't stay for the free for all. I have another no. meeting in like 20 minutes, so I and gotta get going. He is an amazing thank follow, you guys. Tons of fun. He gives you a lot of insights on Star Trek and other things. But anyway, thank you very much. Stick around for the free for all, and we'll be right back on the seventh rule. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Ciroc Lofton. Hello, hello. You know what we're doing. This is the free-for-all. Let's just go ahead and get into it. You guys noticed the NAMs today. Uh, I think it was just all uh, Dax NAMs. Uh, Jadzia got like her eighth or ninth non-appearance mention this season. So, boy, are they obsessed. Am I right? But uh, (laughs) anyway, uh, Melissa Longo is here. Carrie Schwent is here. Radek. Orshevsky is here. Dr. Mohamed Or, by the way, Radek is out in Poland. Eve England is out in Wales. Mai is live from Tokyo. That's in Japan, I bet. Uh, Neil Plot is here as well, fresh off his Vegas fun. Goldu Scott is here. Homer Frizzell is here to shake his head at us. Uh, Rex A. <laughs> Wood is also in attendance. Tierney C. Diekman, the board queen, has got her eye on us. Everybody just listening, she has a shirt with an eyeball on it. <laughs> um you guys know marilyn manson has like a tattoo of an eyeball like right on his it's pretty cool like right on the inside of his elbow that. Nice. anyway you oh, for that manson that? fan <laughs> <laughs> melissa have you seen yeah. this episode recently probably and if so what'd you think about it i did see it recently um before coming on here <laughs> And um, um, I, I'm going to say that it's it's not a comedy. <laughs> and then I really love the melon. <laughs> yes, we didn't even cover the melon in the entire. No, movie. we didn't. What is happening with the green innards? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I was wondering. Yeah, how did they get the innards to look like that? I mean. It does say really? in the companion. Oh, Ooh. really? It does. Really? That was what, yeah, this made me laugh. They, <laughs> this is one of the biggest problems they had, apparently, was how to do the watermelon <laughs> to make it not actual watermelon. So they obviously painted it purple and they said, well, this is going to obviously, when it explodes, it's obviously going to look like a proper watermelon. So what they did is they, but what, they went to the catering team and got some tapioca and dyed it what they call a pukey green. And then they injected it from the other side that you couldn't see until it totally mushed up all of the stuff inside so it's basically <laughs> blue pukey tapioca <laughs> gross yeah. the exorcist yeah and they said they were really pleased with how that turned out and it didn't get what they didn't because they were really worried that if they had to do it twice that obviously the carpet and the set would be pretty gross so they were really pleased it worked out <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um 
So I, I mean, I was pretty thrilled about the melon that, <laughs> um, that I had to put it up, you know, here we go. And, um, I kept thinking through this episode, the scenes with Bashir and O'Brien and how much I love their friendship. And, yeah. um, it, it, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I love their friendship. And I do like that they paired Esri and Bashir a little bit more in this episode to give us hints of what may be to come. Um, no spoilers, but... Uh, Air muffs are yeah. all. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, but... I, I do have to confess that this episode is a little bit slow for me mm. um, on a whole. Uh, <laughs> and I and I usually am okay with slow, uh, watching slow things, but this one was a little bit slower than than um, I, I usually like. I don't know. So Robert mentioned that if he had a, a pass at this script now, he mm -hmm. said something to the effect of that he would focus more on like the mystery aspect of it and the killer mm -hmm. aspect of it, uh, which, you know, might have, it's my own words here, which might have taken away from the character development of the, of the first guy that got killed or the second one. Do you think that right. would have made it faster for you? Or I think, I think so. Um, it, focusing more on the mystery of who the killer is, I, I think that would have been better hmm. because um, the song at, at first, the interaction between Duran and Esri was great, but then it kind of got repetitive in hmm. my opinion. Uh, so I think if they had had focused a little bit more um, on the mystery rather than the, the dance between Duran and Esri, that it may have, uh, picked up the pace a little bit more for mm -hmm. me personally. Well, now that we've heard from Elisa Longo, notorious Star Trek hater, how about <laughs> uh, somebody a little more pot? Anil, tell us why Aww. you love this episode and gave it a 10 <laughs> on IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I agree with Melissa. Uh -huh. I like I like the concept. Mm -hmm. I like the concept of the episode. And some of the best parts were like when Bashir was talking about trying to figure out what gun might have been used and mm. how the bullet would have. And I was like, that's mm. great. I want more of that. And then we didn't get more of that. I think that was kind of a, I think every, you know, everyone's right that that was the, the thread of the, uh, of the episode that they should have just stuck with. Cause the concept is kind of cool, you know, and then it's mm -hmm. like beaming bullets and beaming torpedoes, like, you know, as a weapon is kind of an interesting idea. Um, but I, I do have a nitpick. Ooh, get them. And it has something to do with the melon, sort of. <laughs> and they're going <laughs> to shoot the melon. And O'Brien is like, O'Brien is like, uh, put your goggles on. I get why Ezra puts the goggles on. But why does Odo need safety goggles? He doesn't really have Ooh, eyes. Good, <laughs> thank you. Good wow. call. So, yeah. That was my wow. nitpick. Trying to be a good example. That's all it is. <laughs> an OSHA an thing. Plus it's an OSHA yeah. thing. OSHA yeah. thing. So. Oh, yeah. Regulations. So, yeah. Yeah. security, man. <laughs> the union. <Yeah>. Security. <laughs> the orange yeah. helmet. Yeah. Oh, boy. That's solid. That's yeah. a solid so to speak. Nitpick, though. Yeah. <laughs> Not really a solid. But mm -hmm. anyway, uh, my, it's 6 30 in the morning where you are. Uh, it is. Did you get up an hour earlier to uh, watch this episode? No, I did that before I went to bed. That was <laughs> my homework. Yeah. It's kind of close to going back to school joining this thing today. I, You know, I watched that thing. Anything that starts out with the Churchill quote has got to be a good show, right? I mean, but he turned it around and made it nice. Yeah. I thought that was very cool. I, I, was a little, I was a little bit curious why it is that Cisco was so impressed that Oda knew about a powder burn was. I mean, we know what uh, archery is from three, four hundred years ago. I thought maybe our characters need to read a little bit more history, but uh, yeah, that, I thought it was good. The, the one thing that I keep thinking about this episode though is, are they trying to tell us that we should look back into ourselves at 
ep- at, at, at um, iterations of ourselves that from our past that can help us resolve things today. And if so, are we, are we saying that at, at a certain point in time, we were that person and at this point in time, we're this person. I see myself as much more of a, a fluid moving forward kind of person. That, that was kind of curious. So I'm trying to get, wrap my head around why or how we would look back at other parts of our, at, 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 at how we were, who we were at other times in history, how that might help us today. I don't even know if they were trying to say that, but that's what I was sort of getting from it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Early in the morning, if that was just a ramble, I apologize. Not at all. Uh, did you love the episode or are you, you just liked it? I, it was one of those ones where you, you don't, you're not on the edge of your chair the whole time. I, I sort of watched it and went along with it and tried to keep in mind what they were trying to say and how they brought that into each scene. Uh, not so crazy about the dream sequences, but more about the relationship between the then and the now. Um, but I would give it a solid six. It's not that solid. <laughs> six. All right. Well, that's cool. You got your fan going. Looks like behind you keeping cool. It's so warm over here. Yeah. That's triple digits for us here, which is still double digits in Celsius where you are. but. Uh, yes. Speaking of double digits and Celsius and stuff that we don't understand, Eve England is out in Wales here. They use like the metric system. It's really strange. Uh, what did you think about this episode, by the way? Yeah, I think I agree with what everyone said so far. It it, it was kind of one of those episodes that I, I had forgotten about, but there were aspects of it that I really liked. And then, but I think it just sort of didn't quite come together and it was sort of had pockets of being a little bit slow and I totally agree that the the bits with you know with Esme and Duran were, were slightly repetitive what I did really like though is the the way that it was shot um the sort of different angles of the station that you saw in this episode that's what I really liked so I was much more intrigued with them going to different parts of the station and are seeing it, you know, at different, you know, late at night when they, when it wasn't full of people and seeing the replica map when there weren't other people there mm-hmm. and seeing, you know, the, when they're going in Quartz Barn, you're seeing them going up the stairs, but you're seeing the camera coming through the, the bars of the spiral staircase and things. So I, th- there's a lot of stuff in the companion about the, um, the director was a previous sort of special effects supervisor or visual effects oh, supervisor at some point. I wondered about that. Yeah. Yeah, and they said that so that the dream sequence, for example, where it was kind of blurred in slow motion, he did all of that by using um, different speed filming. So they didn't do it in post-production. It was all done using the cameras and the way they edited it. Mm-hmm. So he tried to, I think he was said that he was given the example of, um, dark, is it Darkness and Light, the Kira episode? Mm-hmm. Um, it was, I can't remember if that's the cause. But so he, they were, he was trying to give this sort of sense of... Um, jeopardy and panic and anxiety throughout the whole episode and I think all of those different sort of techniques that he used and the way that they I, I particularly like the way when they were you know when as we had the gun and she was going through the station going through the walls I thought that was such a clever visual um mm-hmm. sort of the way that they shot that and that they had so that they they built um they had to build a, a, the innards of the wall and they moved that and then they used Cisco's quarters and split that into little different rooms and then they had steady cams and then they had this guy running back and forth with the cameras to, to to align with the way that she was you know looking through the view screen so I, there were there were aspects of the episode that like that so the visual aspects that I just really was quite impressed with and it was quite different to anything that we normally see and that then tied in with music that they had I know we've talked a lot about the music in the last few episodes but they I think the way that they pulled all of the, those things together really was really interesting to me. But I think that the plot itself at times seemed to have got a bit lost in that. I think the only part, what I really did like, and I, 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 it's, I believe it's something that Robert Hewitt Wolf did deliberately, was to deliberately make the the murderer a Vulcan mm. to emphasize the fact that you know he'd had mm-hmm. this. You, you're not expecting a serial killer to be a Vulcan, and it was really to emphasize how how this ongoing war and the, the impact that that's having on mm. on the Starfleet officers and yeah. actually and, and actually how they're not really getting much help clearly you know this guy was obviously really tra- traumatized and was 
able to do this and he I assume he wasn't under some sort of counseling therapies with with Esri um so I just thought that was really clever and I really like that aspect of it but um not my favorite episode but I just love parts of it and, and I, I love the the sort of yeah the, the directorial aspects of it yeah it doesn't seem like Vulcans are waiting in long lines for therapy right it doesn't really seem like their their thing um however if they did need therapy There'd be long lines outside Dr. Muhammad Noor's office here. Uh, Muhammad, yeah, what no, do you think? That wouldn't work this? well. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about this episode? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so actually I watched it a couple of weeks ago because I thought we were going to talk about it last week. So I, I'm going on longer memory than some people, but it's cool. I, I mean, it was good. I mean, it was, uh, I'd say above average for Deep Space Nine, which means amazingly good in general, but like, relative to other Deep Space Nine, it was good. Um, Two things struck me with it. One was like that viewer that they use on that she used on the gun. Like, what is it? How does that work? <laughs> I don't understand. I was trying to think like, what is the physical basis for how you, that would actually work? I, and I, I didn't have a very good answer to that. It's cool, but it seems like that's the kind of thing they would be using all the time for all sorts of stuff. If they have that right. technology. So mm-hmm. that, that was interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a minority view on on the the Duran versus Esri stuff because actually I found that so even though like even though I watched this episode like two weeks ago, that's actually the thing that stuck with me the longest. Mm. So maybe, although I didn't especially enjoy it watching it, I mean, watching it, I'd like more the murder mystery aspect to it. But now like, I keep thinking back about that. You know, yeah, that, what it reminds me of is that is you know, a little bit different from what uh, May said in the context of uh, then versus now. I thought it more of it was kind of the devil inside. How like, you know, we, we have these aspects of ourselves that we sometimes keep locked up. And, and sometimes they just kind of erupt out. Like, you know, you get a trigger and it's, it kind of comes out like that. And I was feeling that with Esri. So, you know, analogy I always think of is like the, the old uh, Incredible Hulk series, right? And I always thought yes. that was kind of the analogy of how we we keep this thing bottled up but every now and then it kind of it can kind of erupt so i, I thought that was interesting just a different way of exploring it so overall mm. yeah it's good but the problem with the incredible hulk was he would always say you wouldn't like me when i'm angry but we're like no that's what we watch the show about that's <laughs> the whole point, bro we're cool we're we're talking in about that moment. Yeah. We're green eyes and then... <laughs> green eyes uh radek all the way out in poland how are you? Have you seen this episode recently? And if so, what'd you think? Uh huh. Yeah, I I watched it earlier this uh, yeah, week. Yeah, or like a weekend, I guess. Um, uh, I, mixed feelings. I I understand that uh, there is a space for this, you know, murder mystery episode in the mm. long seasons. Um, I was a little bit, uh, I would say. Hmm. disappointed with with what Melissa said that you know we had uh, very short exposure about the story of the murderer right like if you if you read the classical novels I don't know Agatha Christie or something then there is a tension and what's the motivation behind the murder etc and and here it was um, quite superficial on on the other hand I understand that uh, there is a gravity around Esri and and the hidden or or um yeah uh, somehow buried uh, past of 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 Joran. um i i have my ideas how the episode could be better i was uh thinking i i i recalled the, the first time i watched it that i thought like okay if she has a past um murder uh host uh maybe there will be some kind of uh, hints that you know she did it because he like you know awakened and and took over her or something like this there was nothing nothing like this uh, in the episode but yeah overall it's it's an interesting story yeah I, and it, it has its moments including the the melon i was disappointed that there was no name given like you know Arkelian, whatever, watermelon. Yeah, they love doing that. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. nothing like this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and definitely a sweet moment uh, when War follows her on the upper promenade, right? And, oh. and Ezri shows all type of reactions like, uh, oh, you were following me. Like, oh, you really care about me. That was mm. super sweet. Yeah. Very cute. Mm-hmm. And he's like, uh, I would do the same for anybody or whatever he says. <laughs> uh, cool poster in their background, by the way. Awesome yeah. Deep Space Nine poster. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, speaking of cool posters, Carrie Schwent has a yoga towel that she got on the cruise, the 2022 cruise. 
how are you? And did you love this episode or what? I do. And my husband really loves it. Really? Nice. When it, yeah. He, one, one of his favorites, I think he said the other, the other day when we were discussing it. It's a fun episode. I love the actor that got for Duran. He's got just a great gravity to him. And he's excellent with the the dramatic the dramatic the dramatic kind of things I looked him up on IMDb he's been on if you include Dallas four different soap operas wow uh, over the, over the years so he's he's got the the whole drama and potential serial killer thing kind of down <laughs> but I have a couple of ne- a couple of nitpicks oh boy here it comes a couple of production goose and I have my haiku I'll start with the haiku because. It turned out actually really good, I think. <laughs> Three soldiers are dead. Joran's knowledge is the key. A killer is found. And I have Grumpy Bear here for, for, the, for the nitpicks. <laughs> Grumpy Bear. I've used him before. before. <laughs> That's my favorite one right there. Aww. My favorite one. Grumpy Bear. Gotta love him. He's him. real. You... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't like it when there's stuff to complain about. But the computer alarm at the beginning when it wakes up Esri, time is 0600, and then a pause. 0610 seconds. I counted. It was not 10 seconds. seconds. It was five seconds. (laughs) I counted twice. I'm like, wait a minute. That that wasn't long enough. Get him, Carrie. (laughs) That alarm alarm clock sucked. (laughs) And the second nitpick is when when she's telling Joran, okay, as soon as we're done, I can't wait to park company. Except they can't part company. She's his memories are part of her. They can't part company mm. as much as she may want to. Mm. And mm. The, the there's two mi- two minor production goose that just tickled tickled me. There's the scene where she's picking she picked up the photo of the couple and it does like the Hogwartsian thing where it moves for a second and then stops. The hand, her hand is on. I'm assuming the, the the husband's shoulder. She sets the photo down. The next the next time you see the photo, the hand is not on the shoulder anymore. Ooh, good catch! And, yes. and um, at the yeah. end, when when the bu- when the bullet goes past Duran and the air comes out of the wall, his hair moves. It's not real. His hair. I didn't even think about that. It shouldn't move. <laughs> Why not? He's not actually there. That He's hair a ghost. should not be. <laughs> oh, oh, Duran. That's right. Yeah. Mm. Oh. Ooh, really that is too. a good nitpick, boy. Oh, what boy. I did know is hair. That is it. I love. I love. I love finding stuff like that, and I love that the fact that my husband loves this part too. That when they go to so much trouble at the beginning of an episode to introduce a guy and. Make all these jokes like, yeah, you can anything you need. You know, it's all good. Can I go to the holodeck with you? Uh, nah. No, <laughs> no that, oh that guy's God. a goner. Yeah, he was good as that. No way that the guy's <laughs> not a goner when they go to that much trouble. Yeah, uh, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. And I want to hear the story about drunk and San Francisco. I bet that yeah. was a good. I bet that's a good story. I want to hear that story. Well. <laughs> Actually, good thing you said that because Tierney C. Diekman has a ton of drunken Ensign Cisco stories that she is going to share with us. Well, maybe next week. But what did you think of this episode uh, now? <laughs> well, um, this uh, this has always been one of those uh, take it or leave it depending on mood episodes. But for the most part, I've always enjoyed watching it. Um but I do have a question just for the group, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming everyone's felt like this. When you go and rewatch something, uh, no matter how many times you've seen it, do you think, hope that it's going to play out differently? Like, you watch through it and you think, why didn't they do this and this and this? You imagine a better episode as <laughs> as it happens just like oh they could have done this and it could have been so much better um and, and this has always been one of those but uh i i still enjoy it just because of the murder mystery 
I love a good, gruesome, gritty murder mystery. And this is kind of as close as you can get sometimes to that with a bit of camp, um, you know, with our, our friend, the painted melon. Um, and I, I, I didn't get a chance to go through the companion this week, uh, for any, uh, deeper detail. So I did not know about the tapioca thing. Thank you, Eve, for that horrible textural (laughs) but um they they put some work into that one wow but i like that that was kind of a throwback to some of the things they did with like the original series and lots of other uh sci-fi series stargate was notorious for doing things like that they they even referenced themselves in you know painted fruit but um (laughs) i in instead of the many nitpicks um that I could have with this. There is one real big nitpick that I, I've always had is the change in Duran's actor is so severe. We were wondering about that. No. And um, I, I, I actually prefer this version of Duran. He's so dark. Uh, he He's is sinister. a... He is a killer and he goes into it with, with Esri to get into the mind of a killer. You have to, or to catch a killer, you have to get into the mind of a killer. You have to think like one. And uh, I would think with her background in psychology, she would at least have some inherent knowledge of profiling, but maybe not just because Starfleet, they don't even consider these things. I mean, if they're not considering projectile weapons and this technology to look through bulkheads, which is just phenomenal, there's probably just something of like, nope, we're just not even touching this. This is too many creepy applications. We're just not even going to do it. But um, one thing I I always think of is uh, it would have been awesome if instead of bringing in a completely different actor which just kind of sets you up of really, they just brought in a new actor out of the blue with no explanation as to why. Um, If they had reused uh, Cisco through a Jantara process, like he did for Jadzia's Jantara, Mm. that uh, through Esri, even with knowing uh, some criminal profiling possibly that this would be the best way to get into the mind to catch this this killer if this is if this has to be someone who's a starfleet officer um that is murdering other starfleet officers this is very very serious um especially like one thing that might put him over the edge that they don't bring up it's not touched on is that the second the science officer that's killed is like a senior officer she it's, it is noted that she would have worked under Jadzia very likely. And she's been on the station for three years and yet no one seems to know who she is. You know, she, she should have been pretty well known. It could have been something if she was well known that that turns the tide for Cisco of, okay, I'll do this. And he embodies Joran for her and helps her with this. And you could have lots of things. Security has to be around. Mm-hmm. You know, Worf's there. He's also a little bit pissed that, you know, um, Duran is there with Esri and therefore Dax and he's trying to protect her. And uh, it's it's a conflict in his loyalties because of Cisco. There could be a little bit of a battle. There could be, you know, people on the station don't know that he's risking himself for this, that the emissary is risking himself for the mind of a murderer trying to find you know the killer of what with this going on and an opportunity for Avery to stretch his legs in as an actor for something a little different and you know scheduling who the heck knows he's barely in the episode but mm-hmm. um would have been every fun, time though. I watch that I think why did they bring someone new in when we've already seen Duran in Cisco and he's kind of terrifying he's creepy as hell and mm-hmm. very violent mm-hmm. like I, I just one of those things that they could have done more with that that it made more sense as opposed sure, to sure. why is this episode here 
It's a good point. But Could have been otherwise fun. Otherwise, I enjoy it. It's a good one. It's a nice Esri episode. Which is this our third kind of third or fourth? Esri Maybe fourth. Third or fourth in a row. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So lots of Esri love, which is great. Love, love that. But. We do love Esri, and I love the uh, the mug that Eve England snuck in there. It looks like a Voyager mug, mm-hmm. but you know who else has a beautiful <laughs> mug? It's Rex A. Wood. How you doing, Rex? Oh, <laughs> I know, right? Did you? How do you feel about this episode? If you saw it recently, cool shirt, by the way. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, it was okay. I mean, it's another one on my okay scale. Okay, <laughs> all okay was, to you. Right. No, no, no. There are some that are really <laughs> terrific. And you know that anything that Aaron's in is always terrific. So, you know, that's all there is to it. Um, but um, I kind of felt like, you know, it was CSI DS9. OK. No, oh. I mean, that's what I kind of felt like. It was kind of like that kind of episode where, you know, they're doing all that stuff to find out who killed somebody. It was cool. The melon, the melon scene was pretty cool. I think it would have been great if Gallagher had come in with a sledgehammer and just sledgehammered the melon. <laughs> you know, that might have been kind of funny too at that point. But um, it was kind of, it was kind of a weird looking melon. That's for sure. Um, the war segment I thought was really good um, because that's just showing that he does still care for Ezri, even though you know it's not to die and it's not, it's not. I can't even talk today, Frida. Um, <laughs> It, it 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 just is um it's just that really moment that he really shows that he still has compassion towards her and that he doesn't hate her in you know over the whole thing and i think that's when it starts to show throughout the rest of the the series that he's not holding that grudge anymore that you know she's got the dax inside of her now um and um uh, and then the rifle was really cool i mean that was like Somebody said before the deal with the bullets and being able to actually, you know, transport those bullets, um, you know, into somewhere else. And mm-hmm. you got to get some you got to get to see some pictures of, you know, kind of like when she was using the scope a little bit. It was kind of a little like a peeping Tom a little bit. She was looking in the room. And she was like, there was one exactly. where there was a couple and you're like, oh, this is no. OK. Oh, 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 oh. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Technology is good. But what are you doing in that room so other than that like i said i i liked it it was it was decent had a good you know it it had a good plot to it so Mm -hmm. um compared to some of the other ones um you know i actually liked it better so Mm -hmm. well uh he wasn't still holding a grudge but we know who is booker am i right and speaking of weird melons no that's terrible i can't say that (laughs) uh Wow. Head, <laughs> I am so sorry I gave him something there. <laughs> yeah, he gave us a lot yeah. of ammo there. Yeah. Uh, Homer Frizzell in uh, uh, Walter Koenig's former apartment complex with the most beautiful melon this show has ever seen. Will you please tell us how you thought of this episode? Wow. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for stuff. That's a pregnant that very, pause right there. Yeah. Very sweet of you to say. Uh yeah. Okay. So um, I agree that I would have liked some more development uh, and to know a bit more about this Vulcan rather than get this lame ass, it's logical type answer as to why I did it. Um, I, I, I liked the fact that Duran had these opinions about Quark and about Cisco and how they're going to be a little closer to the surface for Esri now. I don't think we're going to see that play out in any sense, but anyway, I did. Mm-hmm. I did like that. Uh, it's it was interesting that this this counselor who kind of goes back and forth on who she is is entrusted with this prototype rifle and targeting device, and she keeps it in her quarters. It seemed like it was in her quarters anyway, um, which was a little odd that she was just investigating it. And I know they wanted it to be Esri instead of Odo doing it, which I get, that's fine. Um, the, eh, what was I doing here? The trigger, no, I don't know what that was. 
I had something else too, but I'll, I'll just say that I, I liked it. Okay. I thought the guy that played Duran did a good job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Esri did too. I, I liked this, this idea of the trill and, you know, thinking of they are made up of all of their memories as we are as well. Um, it's just for them, they have different names. Um, and so it's kind of like she had yeah. to consult with this piece of her past. And right. like, as we go through life, we own everything that we have done as well up until the present point and as part of what we take forward with us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. By the All way, right. I am curious to know how um, the how Jake Cisco did with the guessing of the IMDb score. Oh, yeah. He didn't guess. He was too shy this week. Oh, oh man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I didn't guess yet. Um, no, this is, this. I don't know. I think this is about a 7.2. 7.2. That's my guess. It was sadly a 6.6. That's because you guys keep being so negative about uh, Scott Jensen is also here. How are you doing? <laughs> you are definitely not negative. What Speaking do you think of, of this make, episode? Oh. <laughs> I want to hear it. Anymore. I want to hear it. You got and nice, pick. nice melon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Homer. I'm trying to keep up, man. Um, I don't have anything negative really to say about it. It is like kind of a whelming episode. I do have fun watching it. I love anything that does kind of push towards uh, uh, Star Trek uh, Law and Order type stuff or uh, Criminal Minds in this case, which uh, a lot of profile and stuff, a lot of stuff Robert Ressler would have really been into into hearing. But I did also enjoy the fact that it was a murder mystery that didn't have to do with the security officers, which it was cool that it wasn't just straight up Odo's figuring us out again. And um, I did think that he had the best line in the entire show that I had to write down, which was, there's nothing more annoying than a corpse with a mind of its own. I thought that was <laughs> such a nice uh, a pulp 1940s pulp line. Like, he has been reading these old novels. As he comes up, yeah, hey, you see, nothing more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, the, and the, the last point that I have to make with this, and uh, I took some thinking about it and talking to a couple of my coworkers who like the show. DS9 does not like Vulcans at all. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, yeah. Cisco I can't sure think of any Vulcans because yeah. because we yeah. have we have Take Me Out to the House Suite. We have that one Vulcan that um that Quark spoke to and used his logic on. She was Maquis, wasn't she? Hmm. Yeah. 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 And then we've got a we've got a serial killer. So I mean <laughs> and then we find out, by the way. Like, I, I'd never see Vulcans except for these little moments. Well, how many are on the station? Oh, 45. <laughs> they're, just the whole, yeah. they're on the other side of the hallway. That's all it is. <laughs> just, just Lower decks. Lower decks. Yeah. <laughs> Lower de- yeah. They have their so own the, wing. They have, <laughs> <laughs> stand around and feel indifferent about everything all the time. <laughs> That's all they do. All right. So we got to figure out this Deep Space Nine problem with Vulcans. There's something there. I think you're right. Uh, we do have to run everybody, but we want to thank Radek, Carrie, Melissa, Muhammad, Eve, Mai, Anil, Tierney, Rex, Homer, Scott, Force Rock, Lofton, myself, and our great bird in the sky, Mr. Aaron Eisenberg. Thank you, as always, for joining us. And until next time, always remember the seventh rule.